Moving the needle on founder failure, one conversation at a time. I'm your host, Lucas Poles, and welcome to Startup 2.0 by Spark XYZ. Join us each week as we give you access to some of the top investors and entrepreneurs around the country to help you think through and overcome some of the top challenges that startups face. I, I think there's no better place in the country to be investing than Los Angeles. What is the problem that you're solving and for who? Like, what is that specific pain point? Sometimes when a company is not listening to its customers and just thinks it knows better than its customers, has a really, really hard time finding product market fit. I want to see somebody that that isn't going to stop. You know, this person, you just feel like they're going to, they're going to, they're going to make it work. Len, welcome to the show. Hey, it's great to be here, Lucas. Thanks for inviting me. No, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, and typically where we like to start is uh, we'd like to hear a little bit about your background, uh, what you do with the pre-accelerator, and then we'll dive into some startup topics uh, later down the line. So I'd we'll love for you to kick us off. All right. Thank you. Uh, again, thank you for letting me be here. Uh, my background uh, in this space is, is deep and wide, but <laughs> comes from a very different place. So I started my career... Uh, working for the Boy Scouts of America back in uh, the mid '80s. I'm an Eagle Scout, so so am I. <laughs> so, and, and that's why we're here, uh, because I, I think Eagle the people who've attained that rank happen to uh, know how to get things done. Yeah. Let's let's leave it at that. Uh, but I spent 30 years in the nonprofit industry, um, and back in 2007, I was attending the Los Angeles Venture Association as a member to try and meet entrepreneurs and people who could mentor kids and high school and junior high school programs, and also to find people who could give money to the organization. The board liked me, and they had never had executive leadership. They asked me to come and uh, join them in 2007 as their first full-time executive director, nice. which I did. And yeah. I accepted that, thinking I'd do that for a couple years, yeah. and then kind of move on to something different. Twelve years later, <laughs> about 2,000 companies uh, that I've seen and looked at and screened and worked with, and uh, having a membership in LAVA and having uh, workshops and panel discussions and meeting investors and going to conferences and watching uh, how people have traversed this, uh, this ecosystem, this startup ecosystem and this venture capital, angel capital ecosystem has been very eye-opening. It's been very fulfilling and uh, I'm happy to be in it. And then this past fall, I got a call from Stubbs Alterton Markleys that runs the Precelerator program in Santa Monica, and I was offered the position of managing director, uh, which I readily accepted. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, it was an easy decision for a couple of reasons. A, 12 years in an organization is a lifetime, yeah. and I was ready for a move. Uh, <laughs> that's number one. And, and I wasn't looking, so I, I, I can say that this caught me by surprise. Number two... Stubbs has been a supporter of LAVA since I was there. Scott Alderton was on the board. And so, and I officed with them for two years no. uh, when I first started. So they were a known quantity to me. Mm -hmm. And I liked all the people. I know what they were capable of doing. And when they started the Precelerator seven years ago, I was there. Yeah. I was there from the beginning when Heidi kind of uh, took the leadership role there and helped her. I was a mentor. I did workshops. I've met pretty much every single portfolio company that's come through there. So again, stepping into the role for me was very easy. It was seamless. And uh, I'm really excited because now I get to help very specific companies and onboard very specific companies uh, that can take advantage of what the Precelerator offers and hopefully find a path to success in this very uh, difficult uh, ecosystem. Yeah. Awesome. No, super yeah. exciting. So. Let's dive a little bit into uh, the actual pre-accelerator. So what type of companies do you look for? What uh, What is kind of your offering? How long are they there? Kind of the whole kind of spiel. Great. Uh, that's pretty easy. Uh, it's easy to say what we don't take. Uh, so uh, we don't take anything that's cannabis related. Okay. Uh, that's just a law firm policy. We don't touch that. Uh, we don't take uh, life science companies that have some type of diagnostic FDA regulation uh, mm -hmm. where they have trials or anything. So nothing clinical, uh, biopharma's out, uh, but health tech, life science tech, uh, those types of deliveries uh, we'll look at. We'll even look at some medical device if there's no FDA approval uh, mm -hmm. on it. Um, and then that's 
those are really the uh, hardware is hard. Yeah. So we, I, I, unless there's a software component to the hardware, if it's an IoT type thing, we will look at it. And we've accepted a couple of those companies, but by and large, we stay away from hardware. Mm -hmm. But everything else is open. What we specialize in, or what I think I've seen us specialize in based on our portfolio companies, is e-commerce platforms, marketplaces, SaaS, mm -hmm. uh, those types of tech companies where, they can, where there's the uh, opportunity for um, scaling very fast, uh, for revenues, and for traction. Yeah. Those are honestly my favorite types of companies, so <laughs> it works out well. <laughs> we align well. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, let's talk about the actual process. So what are some of the mistakes that the entrepreneurs end up making, uh, kind of uh, either applying to the pre-accelerator, um, or why wouldn't they get kind of a yes out of you? What are some of the common red flags? So I think a lack of... Um, a big problem, mm -hmm. a big enough problem where there's not a total available market that's real. Yeah, uh, people come in with grandiose claims, uh, but when you start drilling down and looking at what what really are they solving? Uh, do they have a solution? Uh, have they done a good look at what's out there already in mm -hmm. the competitive marketplace? And I, I think those are some of the biggest challenges uh, that I see with people coming in. So start with the problem mm -hmm. and, and make sure that if you're gonna apply for venture capital, that it's gonna be a big enough problem to solve that will create an ROI on that investment, you know, at the extreme, you know, 25 to 100 X. Yeah. Now, not everybody's gonna get there, but all funds need to know that they're gonna have at least one of those in the fund lifetime yeah. in, order, in order to make the fund work. Yeah. So that, that's what I think we need to, um, those are the red flags. The things I particularly look for mm -hmm. is I'm looking for teams or founders that have some type of uh, experience that they can show that they've been able to execute and accomplish something. Mm -hmm. uh, and come with data points on that. Don't just say, well, I worked for and had this job. You know, come and say, I worked for this organization. When I came in, we were at X. And when I left, we were at Y. Yeah. And I was able to affect that change and grow the company, or grow sales, or hire the right people. Yeah. Uh, so if you can't show me that type of execution, it's really difficult in this competitive marketplace to take a chance on you. Yeah, no, 100%, I agree with that. Um, okay, so uh, founders are going through the process. We have talked about some of the stuff that you do look for. What gets you kind of over the line to actually writing a check? Like, what is something like what What do you see in a company that's like okay, like this is specifically what I'm looking for? Maybe besides the uh, the team in the market, is there anything else in there that excites you? Well, I, I think you get to understand from a pre accelerator standpoint, we're looking at companies that typically are pre MVP. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's really hard to measure traction. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to measure any type of revenues because they're pre-revenue. Uh, so you really have to go with, you know, do they have a big enough problem? Yeah. Do they have a solution that's unique and disruptive uh, in order to make that problem go away? Mm -hmm. And do they have the ability to sell it? And I think most importantly, do they have the ability to be coached mm -hmm. and, and take advice? Because what we offer at the Precelerator is a mentorship program that brings people like yourself and others to come in and help evaluate and, and steer these companies to a solution that's going to work. And mm -hmm. so that may mean a pivot. Yeah. And I'll give an example. We have a, um, a company in the Precelerator right now came in and it was something to make splitting checks easy when you uh, go to a restaurant. Mm -hmm. And what he found out is in order to make that work, he had to integrate with a third-party software that everybody uses. And that third-party software had no interest in, in giving him an API and working with him. Yeah. So he pivoted. Yeah. And now he's got a program that is helping restaurants manage their equipment. Nice. And on a maintenance schedule and know what they have. And, and that's something that's needed in the industry because right now it's either done on a spreadsheet or it breaks and then you have to react. 
And with margins being as high as they as as little as they are in that industry, yeah. you can't afford for machinery to break down. So yeah. you have to be on top of it. So I think he's solving a solution, uh, solving a problem that has a good solution that nobody else is doing. Yeah. And he was able to pivot, and he's excited by it, and he's finding some traction there. So going back to your question, what what gets me over the edge is that opportunity to work with somebody to to refine their solution so it works to address that market. Awesome. No, it's very exciting. And I don't think that we talk enough about, <clears throat> excuse me, about coachability and about likability, especially when we're looking at deals, because I know for you, I mean, a company that's coming into the pre-accelerator, they're, they're, you're going to be with them for the next, call it three to seven years. And a lot of the time we don't take that into account of like, look, we're working in almost a short term marriage going forward. And so uh, no, it's a very good point to, to be able to bring up. Um, going back going back to that too, I think, um, when I look at resumes, because I, I ask to see the resume mm-hmm. of the founders, um, if I see a, a pattern uh, that they've only had a job for 18 months, mm-hmm. at the longest term, yeah. uh, my first question out of the box is, what makes you think that you're going to have the attention span to stay with this beyond 18 months? Yeah. Because your track record over the past five years has been seven eight jobs yeah how do you rectify that with the expectation that this is going to be a five to ten year program and, and how do you see yourself going forward if they can't answer that mm-hmm. it's gone you know I, I can't take that risk yeah no and honestly I don't think that enough venture capitalists look at like even a resume to even try to understand that specific piece and it's interesting because we focus so much on team a lot of the time that we don't usually ask for resumes, and so it's a, it's a. <laughs> I'm I'm outside the box. Uh, I come out of this. In, I come into this industry from the outside, oh. and I look at it. I'm hiring people. Yeah. You know, I, that's how I have to look at it. I'm I'm looking to hire the best people who can execute. Yeah. No, it's for their own program. But if we're going to be an investor in it, I want to make sure that we have good people. Yeah. No, I 100 percent agree. Um, okay, so. You're, you, you've seen a lot of companies in your time over the last, call it 12, 13 years. Um, what are some of the mistakes or what are some of the common ones and maybe the not so common mistakes that founders make very early on? Um, having poor assumptions, yeah. assuming that they're going to raise money, yeah. uh, having timelines that are unrealistic. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to raise you know, $5 million in the next year and I'm starting now. <laughs> And it's my first raise. Uh, I think founders that have a reluctance to put their own capital in Mm -hmm. or are reluctant to go and raise a friends and family round, Mm -hmm. uh, they're not going to survive. They need skin in the game. They need people to hold them accountable that they're close to. Uh, I I think um, once they get money, spending it uh, um, in a way that's not uh, frugal. Yeah. Uh, spending it extravagantly, hiring the wrong people, hiring executive teams before they hire worker bees. Yeah. You know, if it, you don't go out and hire a VP of sales if you have nobody selling. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense yeah, to they... me. But you see it all the time. Yeah. So they're, they're spending their money in a way that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Um, and then aligning themselves with strategics and lining and finding the people that have been in this industry if they're if, if it's in an industry that they're not as familiar with making sure that they beef up their advisory board with people that can advise them on that industry mm-hmm. uh, but I I also think a red flag is if someone's trying to solve a problem in an industry that they're not familiar with yeah no, that's very true um, Actually, going back to the advisory boards, how much stock do you actually put into an advisory board when you're looking at a pitch deck? As much stock as uh, if when I look at it, so yeah. I'll, I'll pick one of the advisors and then I'll go to that LinkedIn page of that advisor and see if they list that company. Oh, that's a good way. To see if they actually align themselves yeah. with it. If they're aligning themselves with it, mm-hmm. that that's a good cue. Yeah. If they make no mention of it and it just seems too far away, then I'm suspect because a lot of times people will beef up their decks with uh, a lot of nonsense. Yeah. And, um, and I think it's uh, okay to call a reference and say, hey, would you mind if I called 
Lucas, who I see is on your advisory board, and see what he says yeah. about what you're doing and why he's involved. We truly live in the wild, wild west. <laughs> I, and that's part of the diligence process. Yeah, really I, I think you've got to be able to, to see through what people, what people put down as real and what's aspirational. Yeah. Because it's not that people are lying intentionally. Yeah. I think people have all good intention, but there's, they, they, they position themselves with aspiration. Yeah. And while that's all well and good, it's not real. Yeah. <laughs> I think that some of the time they'll, even when they do that, they'll end up falling into the trap of uh, thinking that this person is 100% dialed in. And then when they actually, maybe they get that fundraise and they get to that next stage where they actually need the help and they're not there, things will end up going awry because yeah. they made those assumptions. It unravels. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the other thing I see um, is not having the right partner and co-founder uh, where that becomes an issue. Yeah, uh, uh, that's a nice segue into the next question. So what what team issues do you typically end up seeing with the founders? I've seen everything from things that work brilliantly mm -hmm. uh, to teams that uh, don't work so well. And um, a good example would be a founding team of an even number. Mm -hmm on a board, okay. let's say four, Yeah. <laughs> and what happens if you have a 2-2 two -two split? Yeah. How do you rectify that? One part of the team wants to go in one direction, the other team part of the team wants to go in another direction, and they can't talk to each other. That blows up the company. Yeah. It, it just goes away. So uh, I think making sure you have the right people, that you've done the diligence on them, that you understand what everybody is going to do, and you have a way to get out of it. Um, if someone's not performing. Yeah. Uh, I think that's interesting. I think one of my favorite questions actually to ask the CEO when I'm doing due diligence is like, okay, say you actually end up raising this round and the co-founder isn't, isn't performing at that next stage that you need them to perform. Like, can you actually fire them? And a lot of the time, it's very rare that I'll run into someone that has actually had the conversation of like, yeah, we've had this conversation. They're willing to take or take a step back or fall into a different role if they don't end up meeting it but it's very I don't know it's very rare to have someone that has had that kind of tough conversation very early on to to see what those next stages end up being because you're right it'll 100% blow up the company that's right, right. It, it will and I've seen it happen time and time again yeah uh, the, the other thing on team is if you have a technical co-founder and we see this a lot out of tech transfer coming out of the universities where mm -hmm. you have a prosecutor or an uh, some type of investigator, uh, faculty member in the lab who comes up with a brilliant solution to a, a big problem mm -hmm. and they want to commercialize it uh, and they have a big ego and they think that they can be the CEO oh. and they have no business acumen. They have never run a business. They have never hired anybody. They yeah. don't know how to read a balance sheet. That becomes a big issue because yeah. no matter how good that product and service is, if if you, they can't release it to someone who can help them raise the money and, and tell the story. It's never going to go anywhere. And yeah. a lot of good technology get, technologies get left on the shelf because of that issue. Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, it's team homogeny. Uh, and uh, a lot of time you will end up seeing that. I mean, uh, you hear the stories more around like, oh, a team of all business students that are not doing it, for, uh, that don't have a technical uh, co-founder. But... Just as often, I see teams of all engineers that are, it's like, oh, we're all here. And it's like, okay, so who can sell on this right. team? Like, who right. can actually go Who's out? Who's the least nerdy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I see that. And, you know, so one of the challenges in our ecosystem here in Southern California, in, in Los Angeles specifically, is having that bench mm -hmm. of serial entrepreneurs that can commercialize and, and help new companies get off the ground. Yeah. And we just don't have the amount of people in that category that we need to, to build our ecosystem quickly. Yeah. Because we leave a lot of stuff on the table because we don't have the right team leadership. Yeah. And if you compare us to, say, the Bay Area, which is a benchmark area, they have so many serial entrepreneurs that have gone through the life cycle of so many different types of companies in so many different industries that it's easy to find people yeah uh, and we just don't have that stable of people yeah 
That's true. I've actually heard about some of the uh, some of the larger funds here in LA that uh, have developed venture studios alongside their actual fund for developing the ideas. They're having very tough time finding the talent to put in those companies so that they can release them right. uh, into the wild, basically. And so, no, it's, it's true. I think I think that's a challenge with a lot of the the earlier ecosystems, LA included. Uh, I'd be curious to know if people in New York run into something similar. Um, but yeah, I, I am excited about kind of where LA is going. I mean, even like I'm originally from LA and I never, like the first time someone told me Silicon Beach, I was like, what are you even talking about? Like, yeah. <laughs> I remember when that happened. It was like 2008. <laughs> And someone coined the Silicon, and I forget who it was, no. and there was a lot of pushback. Governmental entities didn't like it. No. Uh, the city of Malibu didn't like it. The city of Santa Monica didn't like it uh, because it was taken away from their brand. Yeah. And uh, it has grown faster than uh, you know people expected it to, and it's taken on its own life. But it's really hard to talk about Silicon Beach and then talk about Pasadena. Yeah. Because they're 30 miles from the beach, yeah. and it doesn't make any sense. No. Uh, so they don't identify with it. So as a Southern California region or a Los Angeles region, we just have to realize you know, where we are mm-hmm. and what our assets are. And our assets in this ecosystem are great. We have more research institutions uh, than any other sector, uh, region in the country, yeah. I think. Uh, we produce the most number of engineers in the world. Yeah, which is, to me, which is nuts. Like, USC alone, I think, graduates like six, like 60,000 or something ridiculous. But yeah, it's... Uh... So there's not a lot of, there's not no shortage of engineering talent. Yeah. Uh, it's here. Now, a lot of it goes away. Uh, probably half of those engineers are from foreign countries, so they're going back to their country of domain, uh, domicile. However, there's still a lot of good people here and there's a lot of good talent. Big heartfelt thank you to Brex, who without their support, this show would not be possible. We've seen firsthand the difficulties accessing basic corporate credit without providing a security deposit or personal guarantee early on. As companies grow, managing expenses has become more difficult and time consuming, which is why we've partnered with Brex to offer a corporate credit card that is not personally guaranteed, offers higher credit limits, provides auto reconciliation, and integrates with ERPs using receipt capture. Brex is the credit card of the startup ecosystem, and we highly encourage you to check them out. Uh, so, uh, Len, what are some of the, the areas in the startup landscape that you're kind of uh, excited about right now? I, again, I'll go back to our university partners mm-hmm. and the research. Uh, there's some terrific stuff coming out, both on the physical science side, material science, uh, life science. I, I, I think where venture capital is best positioned is to help solve real world problems, big problems, mm-hmm. because that's the scalability of solving a world problem, whether that's in the clean water space or energy space. Food technology, I think that's a huge area that I think that there's a lot of ripe opportunity for. Uh, we don't see it as much here in yeah. Southern California, but those are areas that I think are just dynamite uh, and are going to take off in the future, um, whether we like it or not. Mm-hmm. Uh, transportation, obviously, and you know whether you know the gig economy is something that's been uh, it's been very disruptive, almost disruptive to the point that the government wants to claw back its ability to disrupt yeah. and uh, make it uh, conventional like the businesses they're used to uh, uh, regulating. Yeah. Um, so I even, there's even stuff in the gig economy that excites me. I, I think a lot of the shared services uh, where it's disrupted transportation or disrupted deliveries or how people do grocery shopping, it, it's quite amazing. Yeah. It's quite amazing. Uh, I, I have a lot of friends in the hospitality industry and, you know, restaurants are being disrupted greatly by food delivery, where half the food that now that they're making is being, is going outside the restaurant. Interesting. And, and what that does is it, cr- it creates a new opportunity where, A, they can cut down on server staff. Mm-hmm. So, and they have to figure out how to deliver, get this stuff delivered in a way that people will want to keep coming back. Yeah. And, uh. That's interesting. The, the, uh, I it's. Travis from Uber is the one that he started. Uh, Uber Eats? 
No, 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 no. Oh. He started uh, something called Cloud Kitchen. Cloud Kitchen, yeah. yes. Uh, which is a very interesting So there's model. like nine of them in yeah. L.A. Oh, there are nine in L.A.? I think so, yeah. I'm not up to date. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so what Cloud Kitchen is doing is, is brilliant because yeah. it's, it's the gig economy for kitchens. Mm-hmm. If you don't need a kitchen for eight hours, yeah. you need, you're a caterer and you need it for four hours, you can go and use a commercial kitchen without having to own it yeah. and pay rent on it. And um, I believe that's the, the business model there for them. And uh, I, I think it's a good business model. Yeah. No. Yeah, the we work of kitchens. The we work of kitchens. <laughs> the, the cha- there's some challenges inherent with that as far as cleanliness and sanitation and making sure the people that use it do the right thing or you have a cleanup crew afterwards. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I like, I like that idea. Nice. Um, so let's switch it back uh, for uh, back to the founders. So what what should a founder be looking for, like in a VC? Like we always talk about, uh, it's becoming more popular now. Where it's like, oh, I wouldn't go with this VC because of so and so. But like, what makes a good kind of marriage match? Well, it's a, in any relationship, a the ability to communicate honestly mm-hmm. uh, and feel like you can bear your soul and 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 have two-way communication. So dealing with a, an investor that's empathetic yeah. and compassionate and that as a founder, you, that you can be empathetic and compassionate to their needs and yeah. understanding what those needs are. Um, ego is a big piece of this business, mm-hmm. uh, both on the founder side and the investor side. So finding a way to mesh ego yeah. and, and know that, um, and you know, I can work with people with big egos. Um, but you have to acknowledge it. You have yeah. to know what you're getting into. Uh, so making sure you know that it's not just the money you're going after. It's a very expensive money, number one. So yeah. the, the value add of, of that expense oh. is that you get great advice, you get someone who's present, you get someone who's interested with domain experience, uh, someone who can bring other assets uh, to the table for you. Mm-hmm. So you, you really have to do some homework and, and not just take any investor. Mm-hmm from a fund standpoint. Angel investors may be a little different because A, they don't take as much. Yeah. Uh, but even when you're taking angel money, find people that can add value to your organization beyond just writing a check. Yeah, I 100% agree. And I think that, you know, the thing that people don't, uh, they don't take that into account. They see, I mean, capital is a tool, but if you can leverage it additionally through additional connections, like my, I don't know, my, my perfect like $2 million like seed round would be three VCs that um, all have some type of expertise in the space and can make introductions and do follow on investment. And the last 500K is like, give me another like 10 to 20 angels that like uh, can add a ton of value to what I'm doing and can help me in other ways that someone else might not be able to. Uh, so, not 100% agree. Uh, kind Look, of that. just about anybody can go to the bank and get a personal loan for, say, 50 grand. Yeah. Right? That might be cheaper money and smarter money in the long run than taking an investor on that is going to be a pain in the ass. Very true. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I'll tell founders, I'm like, look, if it, it, getting or raising a round is not like a super, like it's not something to celebrate. It's, it's like, if you don't have to raise the money, don't raise it. Like if you don't need to take venture capital money, do not take it. There are a lot of extra strings that are attached. It's coming from someone that invests. That's right. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I, I spent 12 years dissuading people, oh. probably 80% of the people I met, <laughs> dissuading them from the industry. <laughs> Uh, because A, it was a wrong fit, the problem wasn't big enough, uh, they just weren't ready. Yeah. Uh, even if they thought they had a great idea, they, it, it, it's just not something that I saw them executing on or that it was big enough or, or it was a lifestyle business and they didn't understand what that meant. Yeah, I think that's one of the, yeah, that's one of the big things. Like you're, <laughs> you're, you can have an incredible, and I feel like lifestyle gets a, a very negative connotation sometimes and it's like, look, Personally, I would much rather have a lifestyle business that's doing $12 million a year in profit straight to me than a venture-backed like uh, business doing $100 million in revenue. Like, 
there's not just because it's a lifestyle business does not mean it's it's not as good or as great as anything else. You might not be in TechCrunch, but that's okay. That's <laughs> okay. <laughs> you you actually in the long run might make more money. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you may not make money as quick. Yeah. Um, and maybe you'll make it quicker. I you know, look, lifestyle business is something that isn't scalable. Yeah. Beyond what you're doing, but it creates jobs. It's good for you. It's good for your family. Mm -hmm. Go for it. Yeah. And there's lots of resources for people that want to raise money to support a lifestyle business. No. It's just not venture capital. Yeah. yeah. And I think the, the, going back to your point about the, the market uh, size piece, I don't think that, I don't think a lot of founders look at it from a perspective of like, I don't think a lot of founders understand that a single deal has to return basically the entire fund. I don't really think that they think in those terms, especially when they're considering the, the TAM of an actual market. It's like, look, I'm making an investment, like I'm chasing the winners and I need to make sure that you have the runway to be able to keep going so that I can make my, call it uh, 25 or 100x on this specific investment. Right. So uh, it, it's true. There's a lot of considerations that I don't think that they think through, especially from the, the venture capital uh, side. Yeah, and a lot of founders don't understand the pressure and the, um, the strings that pull on the investor. Yeah. Uh, because it's you know at the end of the day the the investor coming out of a venture fund or third party brokers mm -hmm. they're using other people's money sometimes they have their own money in but yeah. by and large it's other people's money that they've promised that they're going to make this 17% return on AR yeah right yeah. and that's a, you know if i could get 17% of my money <laughs> annually i would be thrilled yeah i would be ecstatic Right, but I'm not Warren Buffett, <laughs> so I can't diversify to the extent that oh. that he's able to to, to to build those kinds of returns. Yeah. Uh, not not many people are. Oh gosh, um, I, yeah, I don't think that uh, I don't think founders realize that VCs have like bosses in LPs. That's like, right. I, I really well, some of them don't act like they do. That's part of the the allure of yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> It's like I get a lot of people come to me, Len, uh, and they're coming out of business school, whatever. I want to, I want to go to work for a venture capital fund. I said, really? Why? And what qualifies you to do that? Yeah. <laughs> what industry domain experience do you have yeah. for a particular fund? Um, what analytical abilities do you have? You know, there are analysts that are good, and they, 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 we need good analysts in all of our funds yeah. to help uh, do the diligence and mm -hmm. make sure that we're getting good deals. Uh, but why you would want to take on that uh, liability because there's a huge liability to be a fund manager. Yeah. It's not it's not an easy thing to do. And that, that twenty percent carry looks really good if you can get to it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, yeah. I think that's the uh, the tough part. <laughs> God. I, I think from a founder standpoint when you're talking to an investor, I, I would ask them, you know, tell me about your last big exit. Yeah. And what made that work. Mm -hmm. And how you and what you had to do in order to work with that founder to make it work. Give me an example. Mm -hmm. I, I tell founders, talk, you know, when you're looking at venture capital funds to raise money from, look at who they've invested in, in the past. Call those CEOs up and say, yeah. did you like working with Lucas Poles? Was he a good investor to work with? Yeah. And you know, they're they're going to answer the question. Yeah. So I think there's diligence on the company side that needs to be done as much as on the investor side. Yeah. No, I agree, I agree. Um, all right, so uh, let's, uh, let's finish up with some of the, uh, some of the more personal stuff. Yeah. Uh, uh, how, do you spend your, how do you spend your time, like day to day? <laughs> it starts pretty early, you know, just answering emails from the night before. Uh, look, um, I see my job being uh, threefold. Uh, number one, finding good deal flow. Mm -hmm. and, and, and using uh, tools uh, like Spark XYZ as a tool to, to get good deal flow. Mm -hmm. um, beyond the application and having people come through the transom, having relationships with investors, with angel groups, with technology transfer. So deal flow that they're looking at, from the university standpoint, that's easy because they can push stuff towards me. Sometimes their founders aren't ready, yeah. but they can at least push good, good ideas towards me. 
Um, working with angel groups and investors is the, the value add I want to bring is, look, you're looking at a lot of stuff. You may have three or four companies you would love to invest in, but they're not ready. Yeah. They need to go through some type of acceleration uh, workshop or program. Refer those people to me yeah. because we can help them, whether they need the legal backing of Stubbs, Alton, and Markleys that backs the pre-accelerator, or they need access to good mentors to get them to their MVP or to understand what their marketplace is and do some testing, or or they just need some runway to get ready for a capital raise. Mm -hmm. Those are good prospects for me. So yeah. I spend a lot of time trying to just keep my relationships with, with folks fresh so they understand what my needs are. Mm -hmm. uh, you never get what you need unless you tell people what you want. Yeah. Uh, so I'm telling a lot of people what I want and need. Uh, I also have companies in the pre-accelerator, uh, so I'm paying attention to them, having accountability meetings, making sure that they um, are getting the resources they need through the pre-accelerator, connecting them with mentors, uh, connecting them with investors, helping them with their pitches, and just managing that process. And then, you know, recruiting good mentors, making sure that we keep our mentor uh, list fresh mm -hmm. and pertinent and relevant and uh, weeding out some of the, the dead wood that tends to, to linger. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a, a piece that I, I pay attention to. And then programmatically, uh, you know, I have 40 workshops a year I need to populate, uh, which seems a little bit daunting. When I was at Lava, I didn't have to worry about that. I had a committee of volunteers that did that for me. So luckily, <laughs> as, as a, an accelerator with a curriculum, yeah. we kind of repeat the same one. So it's, it's really making sure we have the best people up front. Yeah. And uh, so managing that process. And then, you know, working with my partners at the law firm, to yeah. make, who are the investors, that they are excited about the deals I'm bringing them, as excited as I am. So yeah. they'll write that check. <laughs> so what you're saying is you're not busy at all. Like not, not at all. <laughs> And that's just my work life. I, I have my, uh, what I call my volunteer life that I'm still very involved in and, and, and working in the community. Nice. What type of volunteer opportunities do you do? Oh, Lord. Um, <laughs> so I'm involved in Rotary International, which is a big oh, nice. international service organization. And yep. I've been doing uh, HIV prevention work in Sub-Saharan Africa for the past 10 years wow. in projects in about seven countries. Uh, I'm chairman of the board for Meals on Wheels in, uh, in Santa Monica and the, the beach cities. I, uh, I'm my homeowners association president because oh, yeah, I don't that. trust anybody else to do that <laughs> job. Uh, <laughs> I'm on the board of governors for Start Out, which is an LGBT focused uh, entrepreneurial organization nationally. Oh, yeah. We just uh, we just had Patrick uh, on the show, actually. Oh, uh, did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, so I'm involved there. Uh, I'm the Chamber of Commerce uh, Treasurer for Santa Monica, so I sit on that board. Uh, so I, I, I have my hands in the community, uh, oh. and, 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 and usually that's good. So let's take the Chamber. Uh, I can bring resources for test cases to our pre-accelerator companies in Santa Monica because I have relationships with just about every industry. Yeah. That's headquartered in Santa Monica. <laughs> and it's just an easy phone call. Say, hey, I have the startup. They'd like to test their product or service with you. Would you mind being a guinea pig? Mm -hmm. And at least I can make that phone call. I can't yeah. say yes or no for them, but I have those resources to bring to the table. So that's, that's something that I think is valuable to the ecosystem that I can bring. Yeah, no, 100% valuable. Yeah. And I also think modeling service to people to know that Everything's not about work, that you need work-life balance and giving back to the community is an important part of um, self-actualization mm -hmm. and understanding what your self-worth is and what your, your worth is to the community. Yeah, no, 100% agree. Yeah. Um, so, Len, where can people reach you? Uh, Precelerator.com or, or uh, let's see, my email address is not as easy as <laughs> it used to be, but it's lonzi at, pre, at precelerator.com. No, excuse me. It's lonzi at stubsalderton.com. Nice. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I have lots of other emails, but if you go to my LinkedIn profile, you can find me there. My, my contact information and cell phone number are published. Awesome. Yeah. Well, 
appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you again. My, my pleasure. Uh, thanks for offering uh, the opportunity, and I look forward to working with you in the future. Likewise.